Hi there, welcome along to another Jenny Coat video and it's really good to have you along and today we're going to be doing a box opening and review but coupled with that we're going to have a look at what uh, you get when you join the Daypole Collectors Club. Yes that's right, I have joined the Daypole Collectors Club and in part for the wonderful model which I'm going to be looking at and giving a quick review of today. So without further ado, let's take a look. <laughs> Those of you who've been watching my channel for quite some time will know that uh, I've regularly been a member of the Backman Collectors Club and I've always been very pleased with the exclusive models that they've offered. Uh, but this is the first time that I've joined the Daypole Collectors Club. Now all the big manufacturers have gone in for this. It's a really, really good way of kind of connecting with your market. And uh, I was very interested to see how the others managed this. I've been a member of the Hornby Collectors Club as well, um, just before the complete rebranding. And I was quite pleased with the package that I got, but uh, when they renewed everything, it didn't enthuse me enough to rejoin. That doesn't mean to say that I won't rejoin in the future. And you also get um, this card. So yes, I am a card carrying member of the Collectors Club. One of the other things as well, which was sent, is this big binder. And you can see this, there's not really a lot in it. But uh, when you open it up and uh, have a look, what it, you actually realise is that your monthly club magazine is designed so it sort of fits in here and as the year progresses you can slide these magazines in. And it's actually quite a nice, convenient way of storing them. So kind of like that. By the time the uh, year's membership is up, that will be absolutely full. Now there was also a whole load of printed paperwork to do with uh, exclusive models that they're offering and there's quite a range. Now the Daypole Club caters for N-Gage, Double O-Gage and O-Gage and you're not restricted to just one. Uh, you can specify whatever you're interested in and for example the Open Day which is coming up towards the end of this month. Unfortunately uh, I joined too soon to that to actually be in a position to, um, to find the time to go to that, which is a real shame. I would have liked to have done that. I mean, you can actually go and construct a wagon and uh, that's either subsidised in the case of O-Gage or free in the case of N or double O. So it's pretty good. There's, you know, a lot of things going on. But we're going to get straight into the model, really. This is, for me, is the main feature. And it comes in the now pretty standard Daypole box. We had a couple of locomotives that we've done. And you can see there, they've got the little legs that go into the NEM pocket. But they're like these really wide, rectangular things. I'm not entirely sure what type of couplings these would be. Um, but they are given in the packaging for you. It also comes with the narrow slimline tension lock couplings. Um, but, you know, it's just um, something that's there. Somebody must use them. They must be popular enough for them to provide them as uh, an additional part there. Now, the locomotive itself, we can see here, it's presented in the London and South Western Railway pea green livery. I'm not entirely sure what period this might be from. I suspect around the turn of the last century. Now, I suspect that this would be one of the earlier liveries that this locomotive wore. It's um, a B4 locomotive, and these were ostensibly uh, built for working on some pretty tight uh, radius curved lines, things like docks, and particularly they became synonymous with places like Southampton docks. Uh, and uh, these locomotives uh, worked the dock system for a good number of years and uh, were painted in uh, a sort of a, a weird brown colour for a while. They got names to do with uh, channel ports 
but uh, in this livery, I, I suspect that this uh, particular locomotive may have been put to work in other areas of the London and South Western Railway system. They were ultimately replaced come the Second World War by the uh, USA austerity tanks, uh, which came in as part of the American war effort, and uh, they were able to work the docks pretty well, so they displaced these, but it didn't spell the end for these locomotives. They did carry on in work, and some of them did also find gainful employment in uh, industrial uh, concerns as well. And indeed, I believe two of them have survived on interpreservation, at least one of which is at the Bluebell Railway. So you can go and see these working, and they are a very powerful locomotive, despite their diminutive size. The model itself seems to feature an awful lot of cast metal, and that keeps the weight up. And it's something that we talked about with the Peckett locomotive from Hornby, and also the Andrew Barclay from Hattons, that they're managing to get an awful lot of weight into these locomotives that makes them very, very able to uh, stick to the track, to pull pretty realistic trains. Now, I've had this running out in the shed, and I managed to get around six full bogey coaches behind this before there was uh, a lot of slipping, and that is far greater load than the real locomotives would ever really be called upon. So their performance in model form is exemplary. I also found that they handled the insel frog and the electro frog points, uh, the diamond crossings, and the double slips really, really well, uh, despite having a pretty short uh, four coupled wheelbase, this didn't actually cause it too many difficulties in picking up power off even some uh, slightly dubiously laid track. I also want to draw attention to the valve gear and uh, the connecting rods on the side here. It's something that Hornby have kind of pioneered, but what we see here in model form from Daypol is that they've uh, risen to the challenge and have really come through and been able to deliver on this. This uh, valve gear and connecting rods is incredibly fine, but that doesn't mean that it's it's flimsy or prone to damage in any way. I had this locomotive running for quite some time, and they showed no signs of either wear or any parts being tempted to give way. So I'm being really pleased with this. The actual crosshead there appears to be... Again, a sort of a metal casting by the look of it. I'm not entirely sure, actually, but it is well, well finished. But the um, the the bit there that goes into the cylinder, by the looks of it, it looks to me that like it might be plastic. But again, it's difficult to tell, and it doesn't really detract from its performance or appearance in any way, if that is the case. In terms of other detail, if we look at the pipework at the front here of the boiler near the smoke box, that is incredibly fine. And um, believe me, I'm not sure how well it's going to show up on the camera, but these are all separately fitted detail. And if I'm not mistaken, they do appear to be metal parts. Now, the finesse of that detail is wonderful. And I'm very, very certain that under close magnification, it's going to look finer still. So really, really impressed with my first impressions of that. We've also got some very, very fine handrails there across the top of the boiler, picked out in a silver. They do look incredibly scale, so that they don't look oversized in any way to my eye. They really are well finished. We've also got the proper complement of top detail to the water tanks there. We've got the fillers and also these little peculiar toolboxes that were a signature of some of the members of this class. The glazing in the cab is flush finished. I'm just looking there. The glazing at the front and the back is absolutely flush to the cab sides and we've got some amazing rivet detail there as well. But I'm looking inside and this is an area which I flagged up both with the Hornby Packet and the Hatton's Andrew Barclay where they had a kind of almost like a block of glazing behind to enable that flush finish. But Daypole really very much have raised the bar there is no sign of any kind of a, a glazing bar holding in the, these uh, spectacle plates but they're completely flush. That is so, so well done. 
Um, that really is a massive plus point for me. Also looking in the cab, we've got a wealth of detail. Again, it's very difficult to get the camera in there to see. I don't know if, uh, if I hold it like that, if it's possible to get in and see, but we've got a wealth of separately applied uh, gauges, pipework, uh, controls, got the um, forward and reverse handle there as well. Um, we've got a brake standard at the back and they're all separately applied, separately picked out with different colours. And then it just looks like this thing could work, that you could light a fire in it and that it would work. Now, on the subject of a fire, one of the things that I noticed whilst running it, and it was very hard to pick up on camera, was that it's got a genuine flickering firebox glow. Once you get the locomotive running on DC above a certain speed, there is a flickering glow and it does flicker down in the firebox which is an interesting touch. I've not really seen this before in Double O. Um, I would have thought uh, if you'd have told me about this, perhaps it, was, it would be a bit gimmicky. But actually, when you see it in the flesh, it works really, really well. If you DCC convert this model, it is something that you'll be able to control from the CV values. And uh, it's probably something that you can make even more mileage out of. But I just thought that that was an incredibly good touch. I'm looking here now at the face of the locomotive and we've got the characteristic dished smoke box door there and it's quite simplistic. These locomotives dated back to the late Victorian period and whilst they were considered just a bog standard shunting locomotive that didn't mean that uh, attention to detail was allowed to slip. The Victorian engineers were very, very proud of their engineering prowess. And really, the locomotive is aesthetically perfectly proportioned and the model captures that very, very well. We've got this typical stovepipe funnel here and uh, there's no copper banding or anything like that at the top. The London and South Western Railway didn't really go in for that. But actually, I think it gives the locomotive a charm all to itself. One of the other characteristics of these locomotives, the very, very large compared to the overall size of the locomotive cylinders, uh, that too has been captured really, really well. And it is something that in a lot of model locomotives, there's a lot of compromise has to be made and you quite often find cutaways in the cylinders to accommodate the running gear. But in this particular model, that has not been necessary. So we get the full shape of the cylinders and it really is lovely to see. On the underside here, you can see that we've got semi-self-centering, uh, slim tension lock couplings and they're in a what appear to be a spring-loaded self-centering uh, mount that allows a degree of movement from side to side. Now this has presumably been rendered necessary because of the wheelbase of this locomotive. It does have a long overall length but because the full-sized real locomotives of these were designed to go around some quite tight curves, the wheelbase itself is very very short. So we've got what is actually quite a large overhang on the front and even more so on the back. So I suspect that this is a uh, design compromise to be able to have them go round corners without having problems with the couplings coming undone or pulling the next wagon in the train off the track. So it's really, really a good show of innovative design there. And certainly when I was running it out in the shed, I didn't have any problems whatsoever pulling a train with it, even though some of the curves out there are actually about as tight as you're going to get in model form. Other detail, we've got fully sprung buffers all round. And uh, they're really nicely done, even down to we've got the characteristic dimple in the middle, which I presume on the full sized ones would have been to do with uh, being able to grease in there. So it would have had almost like a cache of grease in the dimple. And that would have meant when these were rubbing buffers with wagons, certainly going around very tight corners, which would mean that they'd be sliding over the top of the faces of each other. It just meant that there was some lubrication between those buffer faces. It's also fitted with, uh, I presume, vacuum brakes, although they're probably going to get somebody now telling me that the London and South Western Railway had Westinghouse air brakes, but I suspect it's vacuum braked. And going below the running plate as well, looking further along, 
we've got these very fine steps, and they really are fine. I suspect, looking at them, these are painted metal. They do seem quite robust. I'm not going to give them too much of a prod because I don't like to tempt fate, but certainly they're nicely in there, and they are very, very finely detailed. There's nothing chunky about that. We've also got sanding gear already fitted, and uh, some of these, uh, the brake gear underneath as well, comes from the factory ready fitted. Livery application, I'm going to take a quick look at that. And uh, unfortunately, I did oil this when it was out in the shed. I tend to preemptively oil some of the, the uh, just the uh, connecting bits of the connecting rods, because through experience, I found with a lot of running, they can start to wear. So if you oil them from the start, it kind of minimizes that. But you have to be ever so careful that you don't then end up with oil on the rest of the finish. So I'm going to have to give this a good clean. But what you can see is that the London and South Western Railway, or the LSWR, and the number 91 is really nicely picked out with the Tampo printing. We've got this kind of shadowing effect in black and the gold of the main lettering. And then in the works plate in the middle, we've got the number 91. But we've also gotten there, it looks like some kind of lettering. I can't read this with my naked eye, but I've got uh, little doubt that the uh, uh, quality of the Tampo printing from Daypol is up to the standards that we've been seeing from the other manufacturers as well. So I've got every faith that what we will see under very close magnification there is a perfectly legible works plane. It really is amazing that we're getting this quality of detail from models these days. We really are spoiled. In terms of other lining, well, the locomotive is quite simply lined out. In fact, to the point where I um, wouldn't really call it lining. We've got a black border done around things like the tanks and just on the running plate. Uh, around the way into the cab and we've also got the black on the tops of the tanks and it actually works really well it's very understated but it's not too chunkily done and the end result is that it really brings to the fore this London and South Western Railway pea green paint uh, in terms of other other lining and banding the only other thing that I can see is that we've got what appears to be a gold band just around between the front of the boiler and the smoke box. Everywhere else is, is pretty plain. Uh, but I'll be honest, this is a beautiful locomotive. And in this livery, it really caught my eye and certainly made it uh, a done deal to join the Daypol Collectors Club to get access to buying myself one of these. I know that when I did buy it, uh, they were saying they were down to their last 17. So I'm not quite sure how many they did make. I suspect that this really is a limited edition. Daypol uh, tend to do some quite short limited editions. So they really are, in my mind, a true limited edition edition and it may well end up being that there's only 150 or 200 of these perhaps um, so if you do want one you'd be well advised to uh, get yourself to the Daypol Collectors Club and join there and get one of these before they all disappear but I am very very pleased with this purchase. Well thanks very much again for watching and it's been really good to have you along and don't forget to like this video and share it too and also subscribe to the channel and you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when we put them up there. And uh, if you ring that bell, it will make sure that you know when they go up so you can keep bang up to date with all the stuff that we're going to be putting up. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, thanking you again for uh, taking the time out to watch this. And until next time, you take really good care of yourself and we'll see you then. Bye for now. Today's video has been brought to you in part thanks to the generous donation of my fans on Patreon. And a special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Mark Anthony, Michael Churchwood, Mark McShane and Bob310. If you'd like to help support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash Jennifer Kirk. Thank you. Today's video has been brought to you by my books, Bringing Home the Stars, Twinkle Little Star, and also you can get the complete comic collections of All Over the House, Books 1, Books 2, and also the wacky zany Life of Nobty Mouse. Thanks and catch you later.